morning. Um, my name is Liz Stokes. I'm a, an associate solicitor with Hempson's in our Newcastle office. Um, for those of you who don't know Hempson's, Hempson's is a, is a national uh, health and social care firm that specialises in all areas of health and social care. We have a, a large ingress team across the country. Um, as I say, I'm based in Newcastle, but we have teams in uh, the north, um, across the Manchester area and also in the south. Um, I have worked in Inquest for over the last 10 years, um, primarily, as I say, in the northeast, but um, across the other areas as well. And the session this morning is intended as a, um, a board overview. It's very much an entry level session, and I recognise um, some names uh, of participants who may have uh, significantly more experience of Inquest than, than just that this is probably aimed at. This is intended as, as a sort of a broad overview of Inquest, what they are and, and what to expect. Um, so hopefully it may be a recap in some areas or it might just provide assistance when you're assisting your colleagues if you have to attend an inquest. Um, as Heather said, we will hopefully have questions at the end if there are any um, and we can talk about any specific issues that arise um, at the end of the session. So what are we going to look at this morning? Um, we're going to look at inquest in context. Um, it, as I say, it's intended to be a broad overview, but it's, it's necessary to identify where inquests sit in relation to other uh, uh, issues within um, the health and social welfare arena. Um, we're going to look at what an inquest is, if we get back to basics as to what the purpose and procedure is, why an individual may be called to attend, um, the sort of why me question that you might be faced from uh, colleagues or for, by yourself, or you may have asked yourself. Um, a very brief section on effective witness statements and reports. These are the key to uh, attendance at an inquest and the professional obligations of health and social care professionals who, who may be called to attend an inquest. Um, we'll then look briefly at the very practical expectations of an inquest, how it, you know, what you should do when you're attending, what to expect and how you can support colleagues. And as I, as I say, we'll again talk about questions at the end. So the first. Um, point I want to touch on is is where do inquests sit? Obviously, if there's a death within an organisation, whether it's health uh, or social care, whether it's an acute hospital, a mental health trust um, or a care home, death is part of a much wider set of processes that are going on. Clearly, there's human factors that of the effects of a death on individuals involved in the care, the bereavement the, the, and the emotional uh, effects of that, potential damage to therapeutic relationships and lack of confidence. Uh, on individual levels and individual levels of staff and those involved. There are other uh, effects on an organisation, the financial costs, the, the regulatory involvement. And amongst all that, well, the inquest will sit as a process in itself. Um, and today, although we're focusing on the inquest, it's very much necessary to keep it in terms of the other process that might be going along on, alongside an inquest. So there may be involvement from the CQC, uh, the HSC, other professional bodies, potential civil claims or civil courts um, that may uh, have uh, ongoing processes and also potentially police and criminal courts. And in terms of coordinating all these uh, processes, it's really important to make sure that there is a coordinated approach to the management of an incident in order to manage the different aspects of things like uh, information disclosure, uh, issues with employees and providing support. So just put to put the inquest in context of where it would sit or following the death of an individual, it just wanted to give a little bit of a wider look at um, the other processes. So if we go to what is an inquest, clearly the inqu an inquest is necessary following the death of an individual and, and the, the, one of the clearest um, uh, explanations is this quote from uh, uh, Lord Lane, where it's a fact finding exercise and not a method of apportioning guilt. The procedure and rules of evidence which are suitable for one are unsuitable for the other. In an inquest it should never be forgotten that there are no parties, there is no indictment and there is no prosecution, there is no defence, there is no trial, simply an attempt to establish facts. It is an inquisitorial process. So the, the main part to take out of that is that it is an inquisitorial process. It's, it's fact finding um, and it's non adversarial. So in summary, it, 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 an inquest is. Has at the centre of it um, the bereaved family, and it's really important that with it, throughout the whole process, the bereaved family is kept in mind, and that's both in terms of understanding who will see any evidence that is being produced by witnesses and also in terms of um, having 
their understanding at the centre of the inquest hearing itself. Um, the family shouldn't be lost sight of, I think, is the point to take away from that. And, and although it's a very simple point to make, it's just, I think it's important point to make. So it's a fact finding, it's non-adversarial, there is no sides. It is not like a, a, a civil court case where you have an examination and cross-examination. There is an opportunity for questions from part, different parties, but it shouldn't be about uh, either point scoring or understanding or, or trying to establish anything other than the facts. Um, inquisitorial is the key word. All parties are working together to establish facts. I always say that when giving support to witnesses that it's about helping the coroner to understand what's happened, um, helping him or her to assist in understanding the chronology and the detailed facts. And it's to establish who died, when, when and how. We'll come on to that in a second. So the remit of the coroner is to look at matters that caused or contributed to the death. Certain inquests may have a slightly wider um, scope. And again, we'll talk about that in a second. And ultimately, it's to reach fairly neutral conclusions. And the conclusions that are open to the coroner are, are determined as um, short form, form conclusions or longer narrative conclusions. Um, and again, we can touch on that. There is no civil or criminal liability in a coroner's court and coroners are expressly um, prevented from expressing uh, uh, views on civil and criminal liability. There is no self-incrimination. And again, the coroner will give a warning to any witnesses who, who um, there is a risk of uh, self-incriminating themselves and no closing speeches. There is no um, uh, legal um, pulling together of evidence and seeking to, to uh, um, influence the coroner in one way or the other. There are legal submissions on points of law, um, but they're not um, uh, allowed to be in, in connection with the evidence itself. So going back to the start of an inquest, clearly the centre of an inquest is, is the death of an individual. So there have been notification death regulations in 2019 that set out circumstances in which a death should be reported to the coroner. Um, these are expressly provide that um, a death must be reported if they're due to poisoning, exposure to toxic substances, medicinal products, uh, violence, trauma, injury, self-harm. There are a, a set of, of conditions that must be report, reported to the coroner. So where there are these circumstances and the cause of death is unknown, um, where an individual died in state custody, um, then it is important that the appropriate deaths are reported to um, the coroner. At which point the duty to investigate a death um, is raised with the coroner and the, the Coroners and Justice Act 2009 sets out this duty. So the subsection applies that if the coroner has reason to suspect that the deceased died a violent or unnatural death, again the cause of death is unknown and the deceased died in custody or otherwise in state detention. Now, just going slightly backwards in these, that the custody and state detention does, of course, include both um, detention in prison, but also under the Mental Health Act. Um, so deaths occurring whilst someone is detained under the Mental Health Act will be um, investigated by uh, the coroner. Whether a death is unnatural or not is determined by um, a potential type of death and the, and the disease that may be uh, uh, implicated. Previously, we've done this. I've done this session in the middle of COVID, and we've I've done large sections on um, the impact of COVID on inquests. Um, just to, I, th I think I think we've moved on sufficiently from that to not have that as a centre of the session. But a death caused by COVID should be notified should be notified as a notifiable disease. However, as a naturally occurring disease, it can be treated as a natural cause of death for registration process, and. And it does not necessarily now mean that um, any deaths caused by COVID will give rise to an inquest, but there may be factors around that death caused by COVID, which would give rise to a, a coroner investigating um, the facts of a death um, that have COVID around it. And we have had experience of, of deaths um, of, of inquests where COVID has been a factor, whether it be in relation to um, uh, trust following appropriate procedures that were in place at the time and whether um, or, or whether COVID had been uh, contracted whilst in a hospital. So although COVID deaths are not necessarily or automatically um, the subject of inquests, factors around those deaths may still be included in uh, inquest investigations. So when would an inquest be held? In summary, where there's a death in custody, prison mental health, 
where there are concerns raised by the family of treating clinicians or a pathologist. And these might be concerns in relation to uh, the specific cause of death. There may be disagreement between um, the pathologist and those treating an individual as to the, the medical cause of death that give rise to concerns that may be need to investigate it further. And that doesn't mean to say that will be, then be a full um, inquest hearing, but it may be enough to prompt a coroner to, to undertake further investigations. Um, and any other circumstances that give rise to concerns. So this may be, and I'm sure you've got experience of, of various different circumstances of inquest, of, of many and very different factors involved. But for example, in hospital settings, it may be an inquest in relation to concerns raised around pressure sore management, um, around the unexpected outcome following a, a, a surgical procedure, uh, around neonatal or maternity deaths. I mean, there's a, there's a, a whole range of issues that, that could be at the centre of an inquest. In mental health, again, setting, there may be issues around the, the, the uh, instance of an individual taking their own life uh, with ligatures or choking incidents, um, and those who are treated under mental health services who have unfortunately died within the community. There may be instances where um, coroners investigate the care that was provided the, to them immediately before uh, their death, uh, particularly in circumstances where an individual took their own life. Um, in social care settings, we've I've got uh, various uh, examples, but there might be uh, circumstances where an individual is in a care home, for instance, uh, has a fall uh, and, and the coroner wishes to investigate the circumstances of that fall. Um, uh, and this can uh, result in various inquests of various uh, depths or various um, uh, numbers of witnesses attending. So there is a wide variety of, of circumstances in which uh, a coroner will uh, undertake an inquest. So what is the purpose of the inquest? And this really is going right back to bake basics. And this is when a coroner opens an inquest, we'll, we'll need to determine the four statutory questions, who the individual was, when they died and where they died. And those questions, as a coroner will say at the beginning of an inquest, are fairly straightforward. So it's the scope and the how they died that is for, generally forms the, the, the majority and takes up the most time of the inquest. And the how they died will be dependent on whether it is a, an Article 2 inquest or a non-Article 2 inquest. Now, you may have heard this terminology, and I suspect those of you who have day-to-day -day contact with inquests and coroners are really familiar with the terminology. Determination of an understanding the circumstances of what is a, an Article 2 compliant inquest or non, it could be a training session in its own right, so I'm only going to touch really briefly. But Article 2 inquests are those where the European Convention on Human Rights is engaged, um, and the Article 2 provides a right to life and a right to have your life protected. So where that article is engaged and where it's protected by law um, and there is a potential breach of the um, Article 2 obligations may give rise to a wider inquest um, and will result in a coroner needing to do um, an enhanced investigation. Um, it follows the principles that previously known as the Middleton and the Jamieson inquest, um, and, and that is the distinction essentially in terms of Article to a non-Article 2. Um, for a healthcare setting, the threshold for an Article 2 inquest is fairly high. Um, recent case law uh, has provided that um, they're uh, more likely to have to be systemic failings rather than individual ordinary uh, negligence failings in order for it to reach the threshold for Article 2. But again, each inquest will be determined on its own facts and the coroner will give consideration as to whether it's Article 2 or not at the beginning of, a, of a, an inquest investigation. In reality, the difference between um, an Article 2 hearing inquest and a non-Article 2 uh, inquest is with the scope and the implications for conclusion. So an Article 2 inquest is wider in scope. Um, it is, as I say, enhanced. It is likely that wider issues beyond the facts of the individual death can be considered. Uh, issues in relation to policy or procedure are more likely to be considered. And in terms of conclusions, there is wider scope for criticism of those organisations involved in a death for um, conclusions and, and the terminology of those conclusions will be slightly different. As I say, the difference and the nuances between Article to a non-Article 2 inquest could be a subject of, of uh, training in its own right. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it, I think the point to take away is that there is a difference between the two um, and the coroners consider this at the beginning of um, their inquest investigation. So going right back to the start, 
and looking at how the inquest proceeds and, and back to basics. So an inquest should be concluded within six months and must be concluded within 12 months of an individual's death. There are still, however, some inquests that go back beyond this, some that have been delayed over um, COVID. The, the coroners are, are moving through these, I think, and, and some coroners have more than others, but the strict time should be within six months and concluded within 12 months. So what happens when there's a, an individual death and it's uh, undertaken by the coroner to, to, to commence an inquest? So clearly there's a notification to the coroner of the death and there will be a formal opening of the inquest. Now the coroner will undertake an initial investigation and request and consideration of what further information and, and documentation is required. So a request for documentation might include or, or will usually include um, the post-mortem report, request for uh, serious incident reports, any complaints documentation, policies, procedures, um, staff training records, CCT records and essentially the Coroners and Justice Act uh, so schedule five gives the coroner a power to require any evidence that to be given or produced that may assist them and that again could include medical records um, and um, to summon witnesses and to compel the production of evidence for the purposes of an investigation so that gives the coroner the, the power to request um, statements from those individuals who he thinks or sorry she thinks may assist in um, the investigation Schedule six of the Coroners and Justice Act actually sets out offences relating to witnesses and evidence and where there's a failure to comply with providing that evidence, uh, there are penalties of fund fines up to a thousand pounds and imprisonment for, for doing that. So I don't want to dwell too much on what might happen in the worst case scenario, but just be aware that if the evidence that the coroner requests is not provided, there are potential um, consequences of this. So um, the coroner requests that such information as, as she thinks will assist with the investigation. There will then come a point where following collation of this evidence, uh, a pre-inquest review hearing is likely to be held and that pre-inquest review hearing will set a scope and agenda as to what further issues um, will need to be considered. It will likely consider um, the properly interested persons at this point um, and those witnesses and the scope of the inquest that may need to be taken forward. Um, there's an increasing importance placed on the pre-inquest uh, pre review hearings in order to determine and clearly set out what is going to be useful for the inquest hearing itself. So determination of per, uh, properly interested person, so a properly interested person, I'm sure you already know, but just to let to remind you, is someone who has the right to actively participate in the inquest proceedings, whether by virtue of their relationship to the deceased or whether that where they have involvement in the circumstances of death. Usually trusts or uh, social uh, care providers or um, organisations who have uh, witnesses involved in inquest will be given properly interested person state, uh, status if their involvement is such that the coroner um, requires them to be present and involved in the inquest hearing. It is possible to have a request for a witness statement um, where an organisation is not a properly interested party and, and these usually occur in circumstances where that witness has uh, limited involvement and their evidence is, uh, is non-controversial. Um, and the pre inquest review here would also identify those witnesses or any outstanding additional witnesses that the coroner may wish to obtain further evidence from. Um, these can be, uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with, either pathologists, healthcare professionals, additional family members, uh, members from other uh, organisations or agencies or independent experts. Um, and this all generally happens before you even get to the inquest hearing. An inquest is a formal court process and whilst it's not subject to the strict rules of civil court, um, there is a requirement to comply with the court timetable. So if the coroner requests statements by a certain date, this is when uh, statements and information should be um, provided. Uh, there are uh, instances of the court requiring uh, of the coroner requiring an explanation as to why statements or information hasn't been provided to the date. Usually, you know, if, if there are um, instances where there is a reason, clinicians are obviously up to their eyes in work and cannot provide it, you know, early liaison with the um, coroner, it would be helpful. And the other role of the coroner, um, and something that needs to be, I think, borne in mind right from the start of any inquest, is, is the coroner's duty to make 
prevention of future death reports or otherwise known as regulation 28 reports. And the coroner makes these reports where they uh, identify circumstances that give rise, rise to um, deaths in the future and concern that action should be taken to eliminate or reduce that risk. Um, this cat does not necessarily have to be in connection with the factual cause of death, but maybe from an issue identified during the evidence. Um, and they are intended as um, specific uh, recommendations to organisations or agencies who may have uh, an ability to make that action so that they, they shouldn't be unduly general in their content or sweeping generalisations, but they should be sort of clear, brief, focused um, recommendations to organisations to make actions. Um, in going into an inquest as an organisation, I would always suggest that any sort of lessons that can be learned from the, the care provided or any learning that has come out of it should be addressed before you get to the inquest. Because um, if an organisation, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the, I, the, the, the concept of Regulation 28 reports, and again, this is a session that could be a, an entire training session in its own right in, her, in, in you know, what they mean uh, and how to prevent getting a Regulation 28 report. But it would always be the intention to, to uh, approach the coroner's court having addressed the potential learning and actions that come out of um, uh, an investigation into a death to be able to provide assurances to the coroner that the lesson and, and learning has already been undertaken to prevent that the issuing of a regulation 28 report that it, whether regulation 28 report is considered punitive or, it, or not is potentially open to debate I think most commoners would say that they're not they're in, they're intended as to assist learning and to assist action. And in some cases, it, it's clearly useful to have um, a direction from the coroner that action must be undertaken. Uh, however, um, they are shared with uh, CQC and they are uh, published in the public domain. So where there's a suggestion uh, following an inquest that action should be taken, it would always be our, our intention to, us, to, to get to an inquest having already undertaken that action as far as possible. So that's Regulation 28 report. As I say, that. The, that subject is a training session in its own right, but I just wanted to make you aware, um, if you're not already, that, that that is another issue to to understand that the coroner has a duty around. What are we doing for time? So that is the uh, where we got to the purpose and the the reason for having an inquest. And the next question is, if you're if you're here on this session as someone who has been called to an inquest. Uh, in your professional capacity as a witness, um, and you might be saying, "Well, why is it me? Why am? I, why do I have to go?" That my um, is intended to illustrate the why me uh, issue. So, and there might be very varying reasons as to why you have been asked to attend uh, or provide a statement for an inquest. A coroner has a wide discretion to request an individual to provide a statement or report or any other documents. So that might include medical records that you have. Um, provided entries to um, or um, investigation reports that you've been involved in and they have a wide discretion to, to ask you to provide that evidence and also to attend an inquest to give evidence. So the Connors back to the four questions are, are, are looking at who, where, when and why so they will request whatever evidence and information that they consider is necessary to assist them to get the answers to those questions. Um, and that might be because you have been involved in a particular incident. It may be because you have been present at the time when an individual incident occurred, which resulted in a death. It may be because you have been involved in a period of care immediately prior to death. It may be that you've been sufficiently senior to in order to provide a, a thorough overview of, of a period of care before someone died. Or it may be that you have a particular familiarity with that uh, individual or, or deceased. The other reason for being involved or called to give evidence is where you have been involved in the uh, investigation that may have been undertaken by your organisation. And, and that is a slightly different uh, um, statement and, and way of giving evidence that we can come on to in a minute. And it may be that you have been involved in either serious investigation or root cause analysis investigation and the coroner wants to understand the, the, the outcome of that invest, investigation and the action and learning from it. Whichever reason, you have been called to or been requested to provide information, you should, be, you should be clear about the purpose of that information that you're giving and the statement that you're given. 
if you consider that you, there is someone better placed to provide that information, then that should prompt a conversation with your uh, legal services team at the very uh, um, first instance uh, uh, in order to consider whether there is someone who is better able to provide that, that information. That does not mean to say that you won't still have to provide a statement of your involvement, but it may uh, flag at an early stage that someone else may be able to assist um, as well. Ultimately, it's the coroner's decision as to who is to provide witness information and, uh, and attend the, the hearing. But um, attendance at an inquest following the provision of a statement is usually inquested informally, although increasingly coroners are issuing witnesses summons to attend. And if you have been issued a witness summons to attend, you must attend essentially, unless there is a, a, a very good and clear reason as to why you can be ex excused from it. So the first your first involvement, if you've been asked to participate in an inquest, will probably come through your legal services team um, or your um, contact uh, within the trust who deals with inquests. I, I suspect there may be some of those first contacts on the on this uh, session. But from a, from a witness point of view, it, it goes back to basics, really. Who, know who is requesting that statement. What are your statements is it you're being asked to provide? In what capacity, as I say before, whether you are the treating clinician, whether it's an overview or an expert, identify those sources of information um, that will assist in providing that statement, uh, obtain access to records that you may need in, in order to write that statement. Writing statements is not intended, as is an inquest, to be a um, memory test. So it is acceptable to, to have access to the records, um, if at all possible, when you're writing that statement. Be clear of the time scales for providing a statement. Um, Connors increasingly set very strict time scales. During COVID, there was some uh, more leniency in terms of evidence provided in recognition of the uh, increasing demands that uh, healthcare professionals were all working under. Um, but if there is an, a suggestion that you're not going to be able to meet that um, time scale, then obviously it's really important to notify that at an early stage. Um, attendance based on your statement. If your evidence is in dispute, um, then it's likely that you will be called to give oral evidence on the basis of your witness statement. And it's useful to keep that in mind when you're when an individual is writing a statement. If there is nothing controversial in your statement, if the evidence is fairly straightforward, um, there is more likelihood that um, you will not be called to attend based on your witness. That is a matter for the coroner, and as I say, the coroner can call anyone who they consider um, necessary. If um, a statement is more comprehensive, um, if there is someone covering also part a similar part of it, again, that is more reason that a uh, coroner may not require you to attend to actually give oral evidence. So it goes back to you know making sure from an early start that the, the statements that are provided are full and comprehensive. Then there is more chance of limiting. Um, your the need for an individual to actually attend an inquest hearing itself. So effective witness statements. Well, this clearly isn't an effective witness statement, um, and this is a real witness statement I had sight of uh, some years ago. So it's back to basics, really, with effective witness statements. And again, it's a, this is a training session all, all on its own, and I don't intend to tell you what you already know, um, but just to touch on some um, key points that just need to be remembered by those who have been asked to give a, a witness statement for uh, an inquest. And it may be that your organisation has a statement pro forma that can assist with this. It may be that if you, um, uh, you need to start from scratch in terms of providing a witness statement. But as I say before, a comprehensive witness statement may assist when, well, will definitely assist when giving all relevance if you're required to go, but may also avoid the need for attendance at the inquest hearing itself. So in base, again, going back to basics, there needs to be a clear, logical um, chronology of the factual events, a title page, numbered pages. Um, do not speculate or guess on making assumptions in the information that you're given. given give the basic details and your obvious information that you give at the start of the statement, personal details, current role. Um, your understanding or your uh, details of how um, your involvement with the individual came about, whether it was limited to a particular admission, whether it was limited to a particular incident, um, and list the documentation that you've considered, considered and relied upon. Um, avoid 
jargons and acronyms in a statement, uh, assume that um, the person reading the statement is not a healthcare professional uh, and, and certainly is not a, a, um, a, a clinician. The coroners uh, are generally not medics uh, these days. Um, and clearly any statement that is provided to the to the coroner will also be read by family members. So it's really important not to have jargon and where there are observations or investigation results that these are clearly um, explained for the benefit of the um, person reading. If your statement provides um, uh, opinions, be clear as to where that opinion comes from and the rationale for any choices or, or actions taken. And also, I mean, check basic things like whether you, if you're possible to check the pathologist's proposed cause of death, if there's any issues with that, and any specific concerns um, that might have been raised by the family that you may need to um, look at as well. So again, provide a chronology and summary of the relevant evidence and an overview. The content of your statement will clearly depend on the capacity in which you've been asked to give your evidence. If you have very limited uh, involvement in a specific incident, it will be a very detailed chronology of that particular incident. If you're providing an overview as a senior um, consultant, for instance, or a, a senior matron of, of a large, longer period of care, whilst it still needs to be detailed, it will clearly be a much longer period and it, it, it still needs to be clear. Um, understand the difference between probable and possible outcome. If, you, if you're giving an opinion on something, the coroner's court works on the um, balance the probabilities and needs to determine whether something is more likely than not to have affected the cause or um, or outcome and, and the death itself. So try and if you're providing details of investigations, you can, can try and work on uh, if providing clear indication of um, uh, whether something was probable or possible. Uh, as I say, again, address any specific questions raised. There may be, by the time you've been asked to provide uh, a witness statement, um, it be an indication of any concerns that are being raised by the coroner or the family. Um, and the more comprehensively you can address these concerns within a witness statement, the less likely they are to reoccur during the evidence, if you're being called to give um, oral evidence. And a concluding paragraph is also useful in terms of um, uh, offering condolences and also um, summarising the care or any specific issues. That is in terms of a witness statement where you've been asked to give witnesses a witness of fact. The other areas of, of statements that we often assist with um, and provide support with and are, are equally in, and in some cases more important are um, statements that um, are addressing those issues that might be the subject of a Regulation 28 Prevention of Future Death Report. So if you have been involved in a serious investigation, um, incident investigation, and you've been asked to provide an update, for instance, as to the action that's come out of that investigation, it may be that you've been asked to provide a statement sort of detailing uh, those actions and the summaries uh, and learning that's come out and provide that. So that is a, a different sort of statement, no less important in, in some cases more so, but it's really important in those st in statements to make sure that the details from those action plans are included. The current up to date position is, is provided, confirmed though, you know, who did what, when and the specific actions taken. And the more detail and assurances that you can give in those types of statements, the less um, likely the coroner is to uh, uh, write a Regulation 28 report or a Prevention of Future Death report in relation to a specific issue. It may be that there has been some delay since the assist incident report. Um, until the time of the inquest, so substantially more actions may have been taken by the organisation to address any concerns. And that's a real good opportunity to provide an update as to those concerns, to provide the assurances that the coroner will require to ensure that um, there's no risk of create, um, future deaths uh, arising. So that's a separate type of statement, but obviously no less important. There are there are a couple of other questions um, now in. Um, I was requested to write a statement about a patient months after I had left the organisation, remembered very little about the patient and had no access to the notes. How should one respond in these circumstances? Um, so if you've always, if you've left in one organisation and the inquest request has come back through the previous organisation, I think I would probably think the best thing to do is to go back to the legal team of the organisation for who you're working and liaise with them and see whether access can be given to the notes. Um, um, because even though you're not part of that organisation anymore, you are still required to attend and, and, and assist the coroner. So 
I haven't come across any circumstances where um, a trust is not helpful to an ex-employee where they have been asked to give evidence whilst uh, an employee um, of a specific organisation, unless there is an issue, issue around conflict, in which case it needs to be uh, looked at separately. But I would say go back to the organisation for whom you're working at the time um, and liaise with them as to whether um, access can be obtained to patient notes if necessary. Right, thank you. Um, and um, there's somebody else wanting to know if there are any um, any medical professional analysing the evidence given in the inquest at all. Is there an opportunity for a medical professional to take up a part or a role professionally in an inquest? And is there a training path for that? Um, no, the, the, the provisions in place for um, uh, medical examiners uh, have been ongoing for some time at the moment no i think is the answer i'll have to look at that further but i don't know further than that lovely thank you uh, well we've reached the end of the questions that we have in the chat box but is there anybody who has a burning question that you haven't had chance to, or nobody else has asked yet if you want to unmute yourselves and ask your question of elizabeth before we end it's all gone quiet all goes quiet. Yeah. I, I, I'm aware that this session is a really broad overview covering a lot of areas at a fairly superficial level. So if there are any more questions or I, we can assist, any of our team can assist with uh, inquest issues, then obviously drop us a line. Um, it is a fairly entry level uh, uh, session around inquests, um, touching on some of the issues for witnesses and uh, what to expect. So you know, if there were more, more complex issues, then please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Well, I think that brings us to the end. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to you all for joining us and Elizabeth here this morning. Um, it was great to see so many of you on, on, the, on the webinar with us. We will be sending the slides out to you shortly and the link once edited um, to watch again. So again, just to reiterate, um, if you need to get in contact with Elizabeth, her details will be on the slides and on the email that we're about to send you. So please do get in touch. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.